Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Juliana Boyle and I'm your host today for our webinar, Trends in Trauma Centers and Systems in the U.S. This 60-minute complimentary webinar is presented by the Abers Group, a consulting firm that specializes in trauma, emergency departments, urgent care centers, and EMS in program implementation and financial analytics. We have an excellent presentation for you today and are glad you've joined us. Our guest speakers for today's webinar are Mike Williams and Jennifer Goodwin. At this time, you should be seeing our slide that says Trauma Centers, Past Development, New Markets, Conversation with the Authors on your computer monitor. If not, please call our webinar provider, GoToWebinar, at 800-263-6317 and follow the prompts for technical support. Feel free to submit a question at any time. To submit a question, type it in the designated questions area in the control panel and click send to submit. We will answer questions over the audio system and not on the computer monitor. Those questions that are not answered during the webinar will still be answered but offline and a copy of the Q&A will be emailed to everyone. In addition, we value your feedback and we'll be emailing a link to a brief evaluation survey at the conclusion of the webinar. We would appreciate it if you would share this link with all of your attendees. Now let me tell you a little bit about our speakers today. Mike Williams is president of the Abers Group and has almost 40 years of experience working with hospitals, physician groups, and governmental entities on a variety of topics including trauma center designation, system design, and evaluating the trauma center and system and ED revenue stream. He has been a speaker for ASEC's ED reimbursement seminar for several years and has been a frequent guest speaker for the American Trauma Society on trauma center revenue issues. He is frequently asked to be an advisor for the advisory board and is an editorial panel member for the publication ED Management. Our other presenter today is Jennifer Goodwin. Jennifer is an award-winning writer, editor, and researcher with over 20 years of experience working for consulting, marketing, and publishing firms. As Associate Editor of Best Practices in Emergency Services, Jennifer has written extensively about the EMS industry, including reimbursement issues, the impact of healthcare reform, and changing del delivery models. Her interviews and analyses have been published in leading EMS and public safety publications, including GEMS, EMS World, and the Journal of Emergency Dispatch. A former staff writer for the San Diego Union Tribune, Jennifer has won numerous national writing awards and was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Now let's get started with the presentation. Mike, I'd like to turn the floor over to you. Thanks a lot, Juliana, and welcome to our audience. We have quite an audience here today, and obviously this topic is very important to many of you. There are about 500 people on this call, and um, it just suggests to me that we're not out of the woods yet in terms of trying to get our arms around this concept of trauma centers, trauma systems, and especially as we see the recent growth in um, in capability. Uh, I want to talk to you just a little bit about you know what you can expect today. Juliana's already talked to you a little bit about the welcome and the format of the webinar. Uh, Jennifer is going to talk to us a little bit about just her opening remarks uh, and um, basically her sources for information. Uh, this document is available, by the way, and we'll tell you how to receive copies of that at the end of this presentation. And then I'll talk to you more of the details and more of the, if you will, the, the nitty gritty, the kinds of things that clients ask us all the time about that help them understand whether they should get into this business, stay out of the business, or adjust their business of trauma care. And then finally, uh, if we have any questions, please uh, put them in the uh, question a blank to your right of your screen, and Juliana will pick up on those. Um, so let's get started. Uh, uh, Jennifer, it's up to you. Uh, sure. So I guess first we'll talk about some of the sources that we use for the report. Um, there were a number of them. Um, resources for the optimal care for the injured patient. It's an American College of Surgeons 
guide. It's 200 pages. It's available for free on the ACS website. And um, it's a tremendous resource that would tell you or anyone that was interested in, um, in you know, starting a trauma center all of the criteria for what it takes to be designated. We use statistics from the National Trauma Data Bank. This is maintained by the American College of Surgeons. Um, it's not definitive. There really are not definitive national statistics on um, trauma injuries, but um, it is also a tremendous resource. It includes data from 750 trauma centers. Um, in some states, there's a lot of participation. Uh, you know, almost all of the trauma centers are submitting data, but in others, there's almost none. So, um, you know, so while there is a lot of good information in there, um, you know, it comes with some caveats that it's not complete. Uh, we use information from the American Trauma Society. They track the number of trauma centers, openings, <clears throat> openings and closures, um, and we'll provide some of that information to you today about um, kind of what's happening as far as trends go. Um, and then uh, trauma centers have been of really big interest lately to um, to news media. There's been a number of investigative pieces. There's been some controversy in certain regions about um, what's going on with them, and so we um, mined all of that. Um, this is also a big, big area that's been covered by healthcare and hospital trade media. Uh, again, there's a lot of interest in um, what kind of benefits trauma centers have for communities. Some of the um, the, the controversies around what's been happening with fees and, and other reimbursement issues. So, uh, so again, we, we just used a, a very high number of, you know, really well-written articles that covered this to write the report. Um, we also took a look at published studies on trauma centers. So, um, you know, in peer-reviewed journals. Um, and so these covered both patient outcomes and the impact, you know, uh, of trauma centers on patients with varying levels of injury and what level of trauma center they were taken to. But um, it, it, there's also been um, some very excellent research done by economists and and others that we'll talk about that talks about just the income, it, the the overall impact on a population of a certain region. Um, if there's availability or lack of availability of trauma centers. And um, we also did a number of interviews with trauma center experts. So these are people that have real world, real life experience working at trauma centers. They know what it's like on a daily basis. And, um, and then of course, um, I did speak with the experts at the Aberyst group as well, because <laughs> they know this topic very well. Um, so just to give a little bit of context, um, you know, this is something that the report covers and I'll just touch on here, um, which is a brief history of trauma centers. So there's sort of two parallel parts of that. So there's there was the development of trauma care itself, um, which grew out of military medicine and lessons learned on the battlefield. Um, the concept of the golden hour, which was, you know, first described in the 1960s by a cardiac surgeon. Um, the golden hour being, you know, that if you can get patients to definitive care within 60 minutes, they have a better chance of living and, and of doing well afterwards. And um, even though there's been a lot of discussion in the literature about whether it's, you know, it, whether 60 minutes is, um, tr you know, truly the exact amount of time that's optimal. Um, it's still, you know, the idea of getting people to care quickly um, is still, you know, at the core of, you know, why trauma centers exist and, and what it is that they do. Um, so, uh, so then the, the other part of that then is the development of of trauma system, so the, these structures in which trauma patients are cared for in. And um, again, the, really the 1960s, there was a lot of different things going on um, nationwide that all kind of came together into, um, you know, they, into building the, the trauma centers and the trauma systems that we have today. 
So um, one of them is the publication of um, a landmark paper called Accidental Death and Disability, the Neglected Disease of, um, of Society. And um, <clears throat> this, uh, this paper really helped to uh, give rise to founding um, EMS, emergency medical services, and, and um, the systems that we have in place today uh, to, to get people to hospitals. Um, in night, and, and I'm sorry, and to provide pre-hospital care for them as well and stabilize them uh, before they get there. Um, in 1960, in 1968, um, I just think this is kind of an interesting fact. The first 911 call was placed. In 1976, um, the American College of Surgeons published the first edition of resources for the optimal care of the injured patient. Um, and then in 1980, the first community trauma system was founded in Orange County. And Mike, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about this because I know you were involved with that. Yeah, I certainly can. Um, I should tell you that uh, unlike today where trauma centers are for the most part unambiguous, they're uh, well endorsed, they're embraced, uh, while there still may be some competition, uh, it's competition whether they should be a trauma or shouldn't be a trauma center, but it's not that trauma centers don't add value. But back in the early uh, 70s and to mid 70s, uh, tremendous controversy about the need for trauma centers. At the same time, we had um, emergency physicians who uh, were just coming of their own. As, as you correctly pointed out, many emergency departments at the time had just whoever happened to be wanting to build their practice. It could have been a general surgeon, it could have been a psychiatrist, could have been a dermatologist staffing the emergency department. So we had these paramedics taking patients to emergency departments and, and almost to the case I had one medic once tell me in Orange County, California, uh, which is no slouch of county. It's where uh, Anna, where Disneyland originally started. 25 million people visit Orange County every year, about 3 million population. They say that, you know, they take patients to the emergency department only to see them fall off a cliff. And even in some anecdotal stories of, of paramedics being called to the emergency department to help them do CPR. So we knew we had tremendous challenges and we knew we needed to start to stratify our patients and we started with the trauma patient um, and using uh, whatever was available to us at the time. Back to you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I was just about done with this section, um, just speaking to your point. So it was really 1979 that emergency medicine was recognized as a physician specialty. Um, and that, of course, grew out of some of the situations that, you know, you were describing. Um, and then uh, another significant, um, you know, event in the in, in this process was in 1987, the American College of Surgeons Establish the trauma verification process, um, and so the for hospitals to become a trauma center, there's it typically involves two major processes. So one is designation, which is granted by the states, and the other one is verification, which is a process conducted by the American College of Surgeons. Um, so they basically got into this activity starting in 1987. So why, why are we doing um, a report on trauma centers now? So um, trauma is the leading cause of death for Americans ages 1 to 44. This is CDC statistics. And um, how those patients are cared for is always an important issue, of course. Um, trauma centers are also typically very highly respected institutions. They're very important to a community and to a region. Um, but there has been some pretty dramatic shifts related to trauma center openings and closings nationwide in the past few decades and particularly in the last few years. Um, and there, uh, 
that's been accompanied by also a shift in the narrative uh, a bit as well about trauma centers um, in in public and in the media, um, which is something you know we cover in the report and we'll we'll touch on today. So um, to to just do a, a you know a super brief synopsis of what's happened, um, at, you know to get us to where we are now. So. Um, in the 80s and 90s, and even through the first decade of the 2000s, trauma centers were in a period of decline. Um, there were some very high profile closures in the 80s and 90s in urban areas, um, in places like Chicago, and it led to a lot of discussion about trauma deserts. Um, at the same time, there were also trauma centers that, that dropped their designation um, it maybe didn't get national attention, it might have been covered in local media, um, but we do know that that, that was definitely happening. Um, there are a couple of researchers, um, uh, Renee Shaw, um, she's an emergency medicine physician at UC San Francisco, and Yu Chu Chen, and she's an economist. Um, and these are probably the the best known, most recognized researchers nationwide in this area. Um, they've done a lot of very good work tracking the impacts of what happened with all of these with all these closures. Um, they've published numerous studies on what um, expanding distances to trauma centers have meant for the population, what this means for patients, what happens to death rates when they do, and um, you know probably not surprising. Surprisingly, they, they, you know, they've documented that they tend to go up. So um, after going through this long period of decline, um, something shifted. Uh, the number of trauma centers uh, have surged in, in, in recent years, but even just in the past few years. So um, just to give you some very interesting statistics that the American Trauma Society has been tracking, um, just in the last couple of years, the number of level one trauma centers in the U.S. increased by 19. There were 55 level two, an additional 55 level twos, and um, a bunch of level fours. Now, the level threes have remained mostly static, according to the statistics. Um, but we think that some of that, and uh, the American Trauma Society agrees, that some of that may be because the number of level threes, the, the number of level threes are actually upgrading to level two. So. Um, even though you know, I started off by saying how highly respected these institutions are, and how they tend to be, you know, very highly regarded in the community, and communities see them as a very, very important resource. Um, all of this growth really hasn't been without controversy. So there has been um, several investigative reports in certain areas of the country where. Um, where some have claimed, um, including existing hospitals and existing trauma centers, when new ones have opened up nearby, that there are actually too many and that the motivation may be more about um, revenue than about necessarily improving care. So um, that's, that, that discussion is not happening everywhere. There are many, many places that um, existing trauma centers and communities are just very eager for new trauma centers. They're welcoming them with open arms. There's total support. But it's just been interesting that there's been some um, there has been some controversy about it in certain parts of the country. So with all of that as a backdrop and uh, with, uh, you know, of course, a lot of interest in, you know, reimbursement and revenue and what's happening with all the changes that are going on in healthcare, um, we thought it was a very good idea to take a look now at what's going on with trauma centers and what does it mean for, for communities and for hospitals. Well, this is Mike uh, back with you again. Thanks a lot, Jennifer, and feel free to chime in at any point. So what is the size and scale of a trauma center market? Um, at one point, uh, one of the early forefathers of the trauma system in the country, Dr. David Boyd, um, called for 3,000 trauma centers uh, to be designated uh, 
wall to wall throughout the country and if you look at the total number today we're not too far from that we're about a thousand short uh, but we're getting there and um, and I don't know that that number had any science associated with it uh, I'm actually doing a paper for him now a chapter for a textbook that he's writing about the Orange County experience because we were the first in Orange County to take the university hospital based concept and somehow figure out a way to put surgeons in-house which we felt was necessary because by and large trauma is a nocturnal disease it happens generally speaking at night and frequently a lot of our patients who are young males getting into trouble typically at two o'clock in the morning and and that's when the least coverage capable coverage was there whether it be a, an emergency physician in some cases that are qualified, but they're not qualified to operate on a patient if they need to stem the hemorrhage or if they're even less qualified if they were uh, a different type of breed, a pediatrician or a psychiatrist or a dermatologist has been mentioned in our report that we're just passing time to build their practice. So um, today we have approximately 2,000 trauma centers and as uh, Jennifer has noted that number is growing and it's growing pretty dramatically in the last two years uh, and thus I think the need for uh, you know to challenge you know what some of our basic assumptions were originally the hospitals dropped out of trauma centers for the most part we had 25 drop out within five years in California they dropped out because of a lack of medical staff commitment and uh, various other challenges with the financing but what they had pretty much done back then I was there uh, they had tried to superimpose the trauma designation and the requirements of trauma on top of their existing hospital system without making any other changes so it was sort of force feeding the medical staff to accept call and things of this nature today it's much different most adult trauma centers are either level two or level one they operate with a level of specificity a level of clarity and more importantly a level of clearness but crispness as to what their role and mission is it's very clear who the doctor is on call it's typically a board certified uh, typically in general surgery as well as critical care fellowship trained and that's the standard of practice throughout the community it's somebody who's really knowledgeable they've added nurse practitioners frequently to the call panel and for the most part uh, these specialties don't bother uh, the other specialties until the next day so in some respects it helped stem the tide of using specialists after hours because the trauma surgeon for at least injured patients could manage most of the cases and and you know just as an example you hardly see a cast room in an emergency department anymore and by and large that has been outsourced to either emergency medicine or in some cases a, uh, a surgical route that may be needed to fix the patient can be stabilized and that patient can wait till the next day unless it's an open fracture so so in some respects the trauma surgeon notion has come to rise and there are people now that are pretty proud of their trauma centers and they're pretty proud they're they work in a trauma center and more important that they're trauma surgeons which is sort of like emergency medicine because that type of entity never existed and thus uh, could have had a big effect on the reduction of trauma centers in the country had they existed in years past I think the other thing is uh, that's really playing into the, the large partners in this country is that they've learned to finance trauma centers differently there are only a few areas in the country that actually have special tax district Palm Beach Florida a couple of districts in California have a tax district one of which doesn't isn't even it's permitted to use for trauma but uh, but Alameda County which is where Oakland is has a trauma tax and uh, there are various other taxes or subsidies that are provided Los Angeles has a subsidy that has been voted by the, the public and uh, but for the most part these hospitals have learned how to use revenue and to uh, if you will just as much as the specialty of surgery for trauma or the care of the injured patient is especially so is its financial 
uh, capability and therefore if you look down the entire stream for a regular patient versus the revenue stream for a trauma patient it should look different it should look much uh, you, you may have other tools in place such as lean such as uh, trauma charges such as uh, more aggressive uh, carving out of your contracts and certain payer contracts and we'll talk about that in a minute and that's been a large godsend to hospitals who have eh, off the record they'll say you know on the record they say oh we're probably just barely making it but off the record they're winking at me and saying they're making a lot of money and I know this to be true because I do a lot of work for these trauma centers either through their upgrades or to reinforce are they doing the best job possible or in some cases building the trauma center from scratch as we did recently here in Monterey County where they've now had a year and it's been the best thing that's ever happened to this county hospital, this public hospital, the best revenue sources has been through more aggressive revenue strategies, if you will, revenue resuscitations in addition to uh, the clinical strategy. Now who are the large players? Well, uh, the for-profit entities in this country have really figured this one out. They, they really understand trauma, they understand it as a payer source, they understand what it takes and unlike the old days where you know the joke was a, a, a CEO of a hospital would have to put a body condom on just to go down to the emergency department because that was them and you know we didn't want to get any of those fluids on us today the emergency department is revered in many of these hospitals as a significant source of patients oftentimes as much as 50 percent of the admissions of any community hospital come through the emergency department not the least of which is of the more serious cases being trauma and then there's this notion that is yet undocumented but it is certainly one that is recognized which is the halo effect of gee uh, if I had a choice between two equal hospitals I'd probably want to go to the trauma center because a they're gonna have the blood available they're gonna have the surgeon who can operate on me and, uh, and a neurosurgeon on call which is not guaranteed at a community hospital so that kind of plays into that's not to say that they're the only ones some of the large uh, systems in the country uh, big locuses uh, are Florida Texas and um, Colorado as well as Nevada there's a huge fight going on in Nevada right now for hospitals that are interest in becoming a trauma center and the existing trauma centers saying we don't need you <clears throat> well there are criteria the beauty of being a trauma center is there's nationally accepted criteria this happens to be the latest version from 2011 of the uh, centers for disease control that specify who goes to trauma centers and who doesn't and the beauty of this is that once you are verified typically a designation process that occurs at a statutorily designated area such as a state or in California at the local level uh, and then but many of them require that you be verified by an independent neutral third party and that's usually the College of Surgeons that's almost always the case now uh, so if you have all that going for you and it, it's hard work getting there by the way you know, for as many hospitals that try to do that there's probably two that don't ever make the trauma because it takes a real commitment it's a lot of work but once you're there and you go out to the payers and say I need to be paid differently for these patients and they'll say you know what I've paid you already for these patients via our master contract and you just have to accept it most hospitals are saying no we're carving this out from our routine contract by the way we are now statutorily required to provide these services Two, we follow national standards which have been adopted locally to which patients go we cannot just sort of cherry pick patients and three we will allow you to communicate with us and collaborate on cases uh, you know for example in California now we find that hospitals for the most part Kaiser's you know been somewhat negative about trauma centers uh, until recently until they operated their own trauma centers and they would try to repatriate these patients well they can't be repatriated back to their own facility until a they're ready to be repatriated and many of our trauma surgeons will say that patient is not stable enough and b you have an accepting physician as you remember Kaiser hospitals and Kaiser Permanente are two separate groups 
and it was not unusual in the early days that Kaiser Permanente would say, well, we're just too busy. We don't, we can't accept this patient. It's kind of a, like you're giving us a basket case. <clears throat> now that Kaiser has three designated trauma centers in the state, their current strategy seems to be, uh, we'll play the game and at least in the service areas we provide, we will let all those, we'll serve everybody, but we will let the Kaiser patients be treated in a Kaiser center. That seems to be their current strategy, is to play with the game as opposed to against the game. <clears throat> Still others out there uh, that have trouble getting their payers to sign these contracts, these carve-out contracts, but with this motivation and with this kind of structure and with some assistance, some technical assistance from the Amherst Group or other firms such as ourselves, uh, you can achieve a very uh, substantial revenue gain from these patients. <clears throat> Again, um, who decides on who is a trauma center and who is not in the future? Well, that will remain to be seen, but I think the one thing that is clear is that for many hospitals, they see trauma as the last bastion of where they may have some choices. Uh, as cancer patients and cardiac patients are being divved up and are already carved out into their own little communities, there's not much left if you're looking for what I would call elective patients. And trauma tends to be that kind of a condition that once you meet the standards and if you have sufficient volume, which I will repeat that because we're not recommending that there be trauma centers at every corner, uh, and you are verified by a third-party entity and you follow the rules, which include the, America, the uh, CDC's triage standards, um, you decide yourself whether this is important for you and the mission of the hospital. It could be important for the mission of the hospital just in general serving your community. It could be for the sustenance of your hospital or it could be just flat out this is a place where we can make more money and help us sustain some other programs that don't make as much money in our institution. Um, very rarely do we find a client that's merely in this for the money. <clears throat> there, there usually is an altruistic gain that uh, is pretty much understood. <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention to you is about health reform and its impact on the trauma center industry. You know, there are a lot of naysayers about health reform and um, about what it's going to do to us or what it's not going to do for us. And, and while health reform payment has increased utilization in the emergency departments and to a certain degree in our trauma centers, uh, it's not the health reform themselves, but the population that's changed or the lack of access to alternative resources. And secondarily, many of these patients that were previously uninsured are now insured. So we've, we've gained insurance on about 2 million people here in California alone, just as an example. About half of those are, are insured by a Medicaid product, and the other half are insured by a commercial product that is a health reform product, but it is still a commercial product. It pays very much like, you know, like uh, an insurance, a Blue Cross or a Kaiser or anything like that. It pays pretty well. And heretofore, they would not have been insured at all. <clears throat> Some say the Medi-Cal payment is not enough, and uh, we would certainly agree with that. But uh, you know, the question then becomes: not enough of what? And uh, at the very least, you're getting money for those that are insured under a more uh, significant plan. So so far, we have not seen the significant changes in trauma centers and if anything a reaction to pursue trauma centers more aggressively as the payer mix appears to be stabilizing. We've noted that in many hospitals their bottom line has improved and we'd have to give, uh, in some cases we'd have to give uh, health reform uh, credit for a lot of that. <clears throat> so so know. Mike, yeah, uh, please one yeah, one thing I wanted to add was um, we did take a look at what the payer mix was, at least nationally. Um, and so uh, at just over tw just over 25 percent, so over a quarter um, of trauma patients are commercially insured. And so they that is the largest payer for trauma care. Um, Medicare was a close second, just just about a quarter of them as well. 
um, Medicaid was about 15 percent and then self-pay was at 12.5 percent and these are you know post health reform figures um, part of the reason why commercial insurance is such a significant portion is because um, a lot of trauma patients are you know relatively young and working aged Americans that get hurt when they're out you know doing whatever it is they're doing to cause uh, you know trauma injuries um, but you know one of the things we also did find is that you know payer mix can vary substantially depending on your region or your state um, which is v something really important for hospitals that are considering establishing them you know they have to look at their own payer mix um, and just as one example um, in Florida Medicare is is higher than it is elsewhere and the estimates put it at up to 40 percent of patients are um, have Medicare that's a good point uh, because it's sort of like uh, uh, legislation and payer mix are all local and um, uh, the bottom health care and, and I think it's health care legislation are all local and we would say that the payer mix is local as well so while we do have reported in our uh, report that we've issued and we'll tell you how to get to it in just a second uh, a payer mix across the country that you can benchmark against by and large they're very localized and you should, you should stand now in some uh, substantially demographic unstable areas trauma may be the only paying customers you see. We see this is true in some markets where uh, Highland, for example, at Highland Hospital in Oakland didn't even know how to blue, uh, bill Blue Cross in the early days of its trauma designation. They had no mechanism to do that. I know that for a fact because I was asked to do an audit. And they have since become very good at it, but uh, it's pretty much the only Blue Cross positive patient they get. So. In so many cases, if they have not been able to make money from trauma, it's because their structure, and you'll see the quote in the beginning of the report, the structure is not set up to make money. You know, we often think of trauma as being a money loser and therefore form follows function. The same thing with emergency departments, but in fact, emergency departments can make money. Many of them can. And so can trauma centers, and some of you are looking at each other saying, well, not my emergency department. Well, think about it. You know, think about how you structure yourself and your trauma center and uh, are there things that you could do to improve it. Typically, a trauma center has breathtaking charges. That's no question about it. We don't apologize for it. It's why we've had a stable trauma system in our state for about 25 years, and now we're recently adding trauma centers. Uh, so if you leave the emergency department with other other than under twenty five thousand dollars, that's that's a cheap trauma center, and you can get to these prices by looking. You know, California is the only state that presently publishes all its charges, and you can look at their trauma charges and uh, look and see what uh, what they're using. Uh, so, uh, but uh, Jennifer also makes a good point that you shouldn't just rush into doing this. You should either, if you're making a change, you're thinking about dropping, or you're thinking about uh, upgrading, or t initiating trauma center. You should really do the financials and and with some very strict performance that have some brackets on them. So if your volume doesn't quite get you to where you think it needs to be in the first year. Uh, what's that going to look like and then you know if you eventually get there the second year or what have you because you've got more cooperation by the paramedics and things of this nature um, but uh, they can be robust money makers for hospitals okay don't forget to ask any questions that you may have uh, in the question box to your right corner uh, um, now on the community trauma center concept I want to talk to you just a little bit more. I have my cough button here for a second. How we've accomplished that in many of our communities is we literally pay the physicians to be on call. And in some cases, it's a mixture of commitment versus payment. Uh, but surgeons have learned uh, through their networks that they can do pretty well. And then you have, uh, by being on call for trauma, and then you have this new concept called acute care surgery 
that can be cohorted with trauma cases and uh, you can do pretty well with that because for the most part most surgeons don't want anything to do with unscheduled care much like emergency medicine took care of the unscheduled care after hours in the emergency departments surgeons are becoming now the last bastion if you will the source for unscheduled care in general so we put most of our surgeons on call um, and I including our specialists and depending on their demand and on the frequency of their use we will then pay them either more or less so for example if we budgeted a million dollars a year which seems like a lot of money but that money goes fast and we then use an RVU based amount and we were able to determine through the RVU or the relative value unit how frequently that physician was working in the trauma center we could divvy up for the first year those dollars but still keeping the risk pool the same for the hospitals and maybe year two you might have to ant, you know ante up the uh, risk pool by a cost of living adjustment but uh, you might have to reallocate some of the dollars you know every physician on call feels like they are the worst uh, impacted physician the plastic surgeons the ENTs and what have you and and so many of our trauma centers, what we found is that they don't get as impacted anywhere near like they used to because the surgeon packages these patients in advance and allows those cases to be handled either the next day or within a few days, depending on uh, how this operates. Um, I would predict within the next 10 years that most surgeons who are on call, most specialists who are on call are going to be hospitalists. And uh, if that's true, then many of them will be in house or close to the house, and they'll work for the hospital, and there'll be less part of their, their initial engagement will be to provide coverage for this care. We'll get out of this business of negotiating with this each specialist their fee. I have one hospital in the Bay Area of California, which is north of San Francisco, where they pay. It's a level three trauma center, so a lot of specialties they don't have to have, but because of community sentiment. And pressure and because of some long history and I'm talking about 20 years ago type history they provide neurosurgical coverage and the entire price tag for all the on-call coverage is 25 million dollars and that's the highest I've ever seen it and uh, and still that hospital makes money uh, of course it's one one of the richest communities in our state as well so um, all being said and done I think we've learned to do a community trauma center differently than a teaching hospital in the sense of we don't make it part of their teaching responsibilities uh, we predominantly make it as part of the their responsibilities through contracts and then pay them for their contract time and there are benchmarks uh, for what you pay and it, I can't quote them via this seminar because it could be construed as restraint of trade but I can talk to you individually uh, uh, as well about uh, what some of the benchmarks are or even have you comment or comment on your current charges to determine uh, what it is that you charge for trauma services so uh, we Jennifer also mentioned the payer mix uh, all payer mixes are local uh, we tend to see a higher rank of Medicaid patients uh, slightly higher a slightly higher self-pay but that's starting to titrate down as we get more and more affordable health care coverage and that can be done retrospectively so these patients there isn't a patient in this country that isn't eligible for resuscitation and emergency care including undocumented residents and some of us forget that but the fact of the matter is you can get care for these patients you just have to retrospectively because they're entitled to emergency services care and by having specialists in or near the emergency department as part of your revenue stream that is specialized for trauma you learn these capabilities and and we provide seminars that make some of that happen for you as well uh, but the payer mix is localized uh, and we leverage most of our payment uh, as a as a function of our commercial our so-called commercial coverage or our managed care coverage although we treat our managed care payers as if they're true traditional commercial coverage we carve them out and we charge them our new fees our new higher fees as a trauma center and be ready to document um, 
the cost of providing care. And some of you say, well, there's just no way our payer is going to go for that. Well, they do. And we've been doing this now for 20 years. We had many timid hospitals in the early days that didn't ask for it. Uh, there are some parts of the country, like in Michigan, where you have no-fault insurance, so they don't really have to go after the uh, insurance companies. They have a robust no-fault auto insurance premium that they can go after that does not have a ceiling on it. Uh, but for the most part in the country, you're going to have to uh, pursue um, a more aggressive strategy with your payers, and you will receive those payments. It may take a while. You may get a no, and then a soft no, and then eventually a yes, because virtually all the trauma centers around you are getting it. So what's all this negative press that you've been hearing about lately? <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about what this negative press is about, and, and it's it's partially about high charges, and that seems to be what the media seems to be pursuing, even though the charges that are I've been asked to comment on by newspapers are relatively modest compared to what we charge at other trauma centers. Uh, but it's a surrogate for going back and saying to hospitals that are in the business already, they're going to potentially eat away at our market. <clears throat> we were there. We have the sufficient volume for our care. You're going to dilute our volume. We do support the idea of having sufficient volume to meet your patient care needs as well as to maintain the skills as well as to finance your trauma center operations. And, and so for most trauma centers, for a level two, that's, that's about 1,200 cases a year. And surprisingly enough, for a level one, it's 1,200 cases a year as defined by the American College of Surgeons. They do not define the number or the volume of cases for level two. And level three, you can pretty much get away with four to 600 patients. And then a level four, there's virtually no volume standard. You're not really doing that much. It's not costing you very much. And uh, uh, sometimes there's subsidies for your participation as well. And you say, well, what's the negative pressures about? It's been focused primarily on the high prices as papers have done investigative study after investigative study, but the fact of the matter is it's typically competitive hospitals who do not want to share the trauma experience. And I'm reminded as I do work in Las Vegas, my team is working in Las Vegas, that back in the old days I used to work with a single hospital that was the trauma center just trying to get them up to snuff so they could pass the American College of Surgeons. And now hospitals that want to get in the business are considered negative, even though some of them have gotten in the business and they've had virtually no effect on the trauma center itself. Uh, so uh, that's what you're hearing. And that's what you need to be playing for. And more importantly, your strategy needs to be both a financial and a political strategy in order to achieve the net result, especially in an audience where there is competition. Mike, I just wanted to add one thing to that, um, just to put, just some, just to attach some numbers to what we're talking about. Um, so these um, trauma activation charges or trauma fees, they are really all over the map. There's some trauma centers, um, typically the nonprofits charge a bit less, and those might just be a few thousand dollars or. or you know, not very much, um, but it's documented that there are some that charge as much as seventy-five thousand um, dollars. So, so when the news media gets a hold of that, um, you know, you you put that number in an article, and uh, you know, communities are not happy. And and this is, of course, for commercial insurance. Said uh, Jennifer, and I, I should remind you that if you do have charges, uh, undercharging can be just as bad as overcharging because undercharging, what you're basically doing is providing a platform for other hospitals that may understate their ability to retain costs, and thus, if they need other trauma centers but they can't support them or can't encourage them to participate, your low charges may be a very strong reason why they're not able to do that. Uh, but having said that, they are different. Um, most trauma centers have used a market-based approach to defining their charges. They sort of eyeball what the people next to us are doing, what the other trauma centers are doing, and that is patently antitrust. You cannot collude. 
and fix your prices and uh, it should be based on a cost-based methodology and we strongly advocate, advocate for that. Uh, if you had to put it all together though, those costs would be substantial um, you know, because um, it is substantial to provide a 24-hour service. And so many of you have gotten used to your trauma centers, but the question becomes, are you used to paying for the, the real cost of those services? Okay, and I think that pretty much does that. Are any questions or any responses? Juliana, do you have any questions that have come in? Yes, I sure do. We've had a couple come in. Um, one is, is that true? Uh, let's see. Um, it came in around 11 o'clock, and I apologize as the asker. The question does not specify exactly, but it, maybe you can glean what asking about. The question is, is that true for level four designation with revenue stream? Well, maybe I can speak to that. Uh, the higher the, your level of designation or verification, depending on which direction you want to go in, um, the more acute is the need for a strategy for having a revenue strategy. So level fours have the least need to be sort of right on top of things and have a really detailed revenue strategy. We offer seminars uh, for sale, by the way, and webinars that we've done on how to maximize your revenue for your trauma center or even your emergency department because it turns out many of those strategies work. Um, but the fact of the matter is it's really the threes and for the most part the twos and the ones that really need an acute strategy they have the highest cost, they have the most to lose and um, thus their strategies should be in play uh, for that purpose. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, is there a method to put a number on the halo effect? <laughs> you want to comment on that, Jennifer? Uh, I, you know, it's a great question. Um, I think everyone would love to know the answer to that. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, I, I mean, I'm, I think the answer is no, there's not a number. I have not seen any research documenting the halo effect, um, but it's a pretty widely held belief that um, trauma centers, you know, can provide these secondary benefits to hospitals, um, both in public perception and, and then in also um, driving patients to other clinical areas. So um, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of different um, things at play, you know, why people think that the, the halo effect is a very real thing. Um, EMTs and paramedics may just kind of get into the habit of taking trauma patients there and that may spill over into them taking um, patients with a wide variety of emergent conditions there. Uh, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, requirements for um, quality improvement. That's part of the, the verification and designation process. Um, it, it emphasizes uh, initial and ongoing um, performance improvement, patient safety programs, and um, hospitals will say that this attention to quality may um, encourage a similar attention to quality and patient safety in other, you know, maybe in their emergency department as a whole or even in other departments and that this can help their performance. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of discussion about trauma centers improving um, staffing efficiencies. Um, you know, basically to make sure that they they meet all the requirements to provide the level of care, um, but you know that that they're keeping their costs as you know where they need to be, um, and so uh, and then then there's just the the whole idea of positive press because you know outside of these pockets where there has been some controversy, maybe when the when the fees are seen as exorbitantly high or um, when there's, um, like Mike was talking about, you know, maybe competition between some hospitals that's kind of generating some of this press. Um, you know, generally, hosp you know, hospitals with trauma centers are considered um, to bring a lot of prestige and they're considered very, very valuable to the community. Um, 
and I, I think also part of it is that uh, you know trauma centers have to do um, part of what they need to do is some community outreach and, and education programs so that I think that also increases their visibility in their community and the sense that they're a, a partner um, and um, one of my favorite quotes that I read was that uh, members of the com community may see the trauma center as the best place for their care even if what they really need is their appendix out. Yeah, and I, I think you make a variety of really good points, Jennifer. Um, I, I would say it would be hard to construct a study that looked at the halo effect, uh, but having personally been in the medical care business for in excess of 40 years, I can tell you where my family and I would like to go. I'd like to go to a trauma center, you know, if, you know, God help us, we had an ectopic pregnancy, for example, it had nothing to do with trauma other than lots of blood and uh, lots of blood products that likely the trauma center is going to have over anybody else in the operating room that's going to be available uh, to do the hard work. A, a AAA, for example, uh, you know, I think you can make your own case for whether the halo effect occurs or, or doesn't occur, but it's really left up to the individual hospitals to help make that determination uh, as it would be very difficult to uh, create the study. But let me say something else. This is almost heretical. As we begin to um, think through where we're going in the future, one of the things we've been doing is asking some hard questions. Do we need this or that? And we are asking that in paramedic uh, business. As many of you know, we're very active in the EMS business. And we're asking the tough questions like, like backboards and medications and does a uh, license siren really make a difference and do paramedics really make a difference? I mean really some very profound questions that uh, the answers may surprise you and uh, one of the things we're asking our trauma centers in you know the old days it was bring everything, bring it all at once and bring it fast. You know shut everything down so we're ready to do it. Well now we're finding that we operate very rare, I say we, I don't do any operating of course uh, if I show up to do an operation on you as a trauma patient, you better be darn scared. But uh, the bottom line is uh, less than 10% of these patients go urgently to an operating room. Uh, so the need for the urgent operating room capability has been diminished. Uh, we used to bring two units of O negative blood right to the resuscitation space automatically without question. And it's because of the morass of policies that used to keep us from getting that blood and now frequently not doing that. We're not inviting as many as we call the welcoming team members to trauma. Uh, a lot of the pediatric trauma centers we've set up, you know, they have an inner and an outer team. The, the inner team is the resuscitation team and the outer team is there for part of their research and their teaching and, and in, in worst case scenario maybe they need a CT scan and they go up and get the CT scan ready but for the most part we're not operating with all, all of our cells and therefore have costs associated at that level. Now having said that there are no published studies on those costs but I think we in our industry, trauma being the industry, are becoming more and more diligent about what we do uh, provide and therefore potentially impacting the cost or the charges that we charge. Actually, Any other? We do, yeah. Oh, yeah, we ahead. do have a couple more questions. Please. Um, let's see here. So, uh, for a level three, what do you consider uh, a three? What do you consider an an acceptable patient yearly ses, uh, census for a level three? Well, um, uh, Jen, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. Or Jennifer, um, the uh, there are no published standards for level threes. Uh, it's been our experience uh, that it takes somewhere between 300 to 600 cases per year. I know that's a wide margin, but it's not the thousand cases per year. If you are seeing close to a thousand triage cases, triage in recognition of the CDC's triage standard, you probably ought to be thinking about upgrading. Um, the big difference with a level three is that you don't need neurosurgical coverage and your your surgical coverage can be on a more relaxed call schedule. 
uh, so the level of vigorous understanding changes dramatically between a two and a, a three and a two and then eventually a one uh, with the one being mostly a teaching and research facility having the same requirements attendance requirements and what have you as a level two so we are less concerned about the volume of a level three we think it's important that you have some capability uh, and um, We've seen some communities, for example, try to bootstrap threes into urban communities, which is not the original intent of level threes, uh, as a way of you know starting. Maybe we can get away with you know level three here, and then eventually upgrade to level two. But uh, having said that, uh, the the standard that we use from our own standpoint, as the Abras Group has set up close to a thousand of these in the country, is is 300 or 400 cases per year. Mike, it is just exactly um, 11.30. Uh, would you like to take one more question or... Uh, sure, well, why, don't we finish, uh, okay. why don't we finish the question? I know the audience probably had an hour commitment to this. So. Yeah, sure. The last question is, what steps, high-level steps, do you take to develop a reimbursement strategy? Well, I think the highest level attempt is to figure out what level you're at and what your costs are going to be and then how are you going to allocate your costs so typically we look at everything from your current emergency department charges because uh, remember it's all a function of your costs and and how they're allocated and then how well you're going to get paid based on those allocated costs if 99 percent of your patients are Medicaid your allocation method may be wonderful, but you're not going to get paid very much. So the, it's pretty much a three-legged stool, and all those have to be in balance of some sort. Um, we recommend a proforma, uh, proforma be done, uh, a detailed proforma that actually shows risk uh, evaluation and uh, and measures that risk, uh, either lean, best, and um, or uh, lean, um, moderate, and best case scenarios. So you sort of have a sense of uh, that you're looking at the entire picture. And um, with respect to the revenue stream for trauma cases, uh, it really requires a review of charts, uh, a review of the people doing the work to see if they're using all the modern tools that are available to us. And it's a long neglected. Uh, frankly a topic area for hospitals in general especially the emergency departments and for trauma centers and oftentimes we find anywhere from a million to two million dollars of new net revenue just by optimizing their revenue stream and that's whether you're designated or not and um, a large part of that coming through your charge and your uh, and your contract strategies uh, so hopefully I've answered your question, and I want to thank you all for participating today. Juliana, do you want to take us out? I, yes, I sure would. Thank you all, um, and thank you very much, Jennifer Goodwin and Mike Williams, for an excellent presentation today. Um, we do have the uh, Trauma Center's Past Developments and New Markets paper, white paper that we've released available for purchase on our secure website. If you have any questions or would like to purchase the website, please feel free to uh, purchase the white paper, not the website. Please feel free to shoot me an email, and I'd be happy to walk you through that. And um, we look forward to seeing you again at another Aberyst Group uh, webinar. Thank you all so much for your participation today. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Juliana. Thank you, Mike.